The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. And uh, apparently spelling is not one of my fortes. Um, I should say March. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, today we're going to talk about innovation and adoption of innovations. Uh, as you can hear from my background, my specialty is in health technology, so a lot of the angle that I'll be presenting to you is from a technology focus. Um, innovation and adoption in general is a highly researched field and highly relevant to a lot of uh, people in the MIT community. We have a very significant community of innovators and we have a very significant community of, of startups. And so when you combine those two, uh, we need to learn how best to apply business principles and innovation principles to get our innovations out into the field, whether it's in global health, domestic health care, or a different field altogether. Uh, so as we go through this, I will present the, the need for innovation in healthcare, specifically in developing countries, uh, the factors for adoption and innovation, this was covered in the background reading, and challenges of uh, high value adoption in the current environment that I work in. Uh, so why do we need innovation? And I don't know if you guys have seen uh, similar slides in other presentations, but the disparity in outcomes uh, per amount spent is highly variable across the globe. Um, this means that one country who spends $200 per patient might have significantly better outcomes than another country who spends $200 per patient. And the reasons for those are many. It could be technology adoption. It could be uh, skill sets on the ground. It could be because a group like Partners in Health is on the ground. It could be because there's other NGOs on the ground. There's any number of factors why this is true. But as you can see from the chart, we have very disparate outcomes based on the amount we're spending per patient. Why that's relevant to the need for innovation is because of this next slide. So what this is telling us is the amount spent per capita is fixed based on the total GDP per capita. So as we look at countries with various GDPs across the globe, we, if you believe this chart, you cannot change the amount we're gonna spend per patient. So if donors come in and invest more money in the country, they're gonna shift money from the healthcare budget to education or defense. So we have a fixed pot of money that's completely correlated to the amount of GDP per capita that the country has. So this means if you only make enough money to spend $200 per patient per year, you can't do anything but make that money better spent. You cannot increase the total amount of money spent. And have people seen this graph before? Because I, I found this very hard to believe. Uh, this is based on data from WHO, and uh, you know, I think it's relatively well accepted now that when donors come in and put a lot of money into the healthcare sector, the uh, receiving government simply shifts their budget around and keeps their healthcare budget the same. So we're not actually augmenting the amount that's going to get spent on health when donors come in, per se. Um, so the, the low resource technology landscape in general uh, is an interesting space to be playing in right now. There's been massive progress in the last 10 years through initiatives that Partners in Health, SANA, Damagi, and others have taken on, whether that's building new and innovative technology solutions for medical record keeping, the explosion in mobile phones has allowed uh, applications that we never thought possible 10 years ago. Uh, it's becoming a very core academic research field. There's now tenure track positions at Michigan, Berkeley, MIT, and other schools for low resource technology. So in terms of academia, it's becoming its own field. Uh, there's a host of new nonprofit and for-profit entities starting to play into this space or existing organizations who are now moving into low resource technology. Uh, and it's mostly still donor funded and this is critical to how innovation and adoption is affected by funding streams that I'll get to later. And most of our projects, even the bigger ones, are still in the pilot phase, meaning they haven't scaled globally, they haven't reached massive adoption. Um, and the, the key takeaway here is that the most innovative technology is not what's going to win. There are a lot of other factors that go into it, and having the best technology is far from the key ingredient to making your project successful or scalable. Uh, that said, there's huge potential for technology innovation in global health and in these low resource settings. Um, the explosion of mobile devices is, has been well described at MIT and other communities as enabling uh, countless applications, whether it's simply on SMS or mobile applications. Um, we have a chance to actually measure value instead of indicators, which is a trap that the U.S. and a lot of other developed countries have uh, fallen into in terms of trying to measure process and not the actual value that comes out at the end of the cycle. Um, 
we have national a uh, chance to design national IT platforms, and these can be designed for interoperability from day one. If you look at the healthcare ecosystem, a lot of developed countries that have grown up with technology, uh, we have very fragmented ecosystems that make it incredibly difficult to innovate and introduce new technology. Uh, we have the chance to create national strategy before we have entrenched industry interests. Uh, this is uniquely uh, valuable to small companies such as myself. We would never have had the chance to build a national system in any developed country because they already have national systems and we can't compete with large organizations. Whereas a small company like mine was able to partner with the Center for Disease Control, other NGOs, and the Ministry of Health in Zambia and actually create the national health uh, medical record system. That would just be impossible to do in any country like the US. Uh, we have a chance to actually integrate multiple sectors together because the amount of people trying to tackle these technology problems are small enough that they can actually talk together and get something done. Whereas, again, when you have entrenched industry interests, it's very difficult to do that. So working in low-resource settings actually offers you better chances in some ways to introduce innovation that can be high value and can be impactful. Uh, and one interesting thing that we find in almost every environment we go into, technology is by far not the problem anymore. In fact, technology has really surpassed most people's ability to support it. And even as individual consumers in the U.S., technology is going so fast we can barely keep up with iPads and phones and get used to all the gadgets that we have access to. So you can imagine what chance an organization with all the bureaucracy and slow moving parts that it has to deal with can do to adopt uh, similar technology. And while there's a lot of opportunities, there's also a great chance to repeat all the same mistakes we've made in other climates. We have a lot of industry interest coming into these developing countries. We have a lot of uh, for-profit, non-profit entities trying to carve out their own space and not wanting to collaborate with others. And so this is a ripe chance to just do everything wrong all over again as well. Um, so, the factors for adoption of innovation, this is largely straight from the, the pre-reading. Uh, Rogers has written uh, extensively on the uh, perception of innovation and other factors that go into innovation. And the five key characteristics that he listed were uh, relative advantage, compatibility, complexity, trialability, and observability. And if you look at those five, and you have participated in startups before, participated in trying to sell a product before, you know that you have to frame the benefits of your product. You have to frame how they're going to pilot it, how they're going to buy it, and how they're going to scale it. So these are really common business principles uh, that any organization trying to sell a new concept, process, product has to go through. Um, but they're really critical in terms of technology adoption in these developing countries, because the relative advantage is sometimes hard to sell. These NGOs are not focused on deploying new software technology, they're focused on getting healthcare implementation done, and paper works pretty well a lot of the time. So it's often challenging to sell the relative advantage to people in an organization who are not aware of the benefits technology can bring. This is not unique to developing countries, a lot of environments have this problem, but it's specifically challenging to present the relative advantage of technology, because paper is very sufficient in a lot of ways when you're talking about getting the job done. From a supervision standpoint, that's really where technology can make a huge impact in a lot of the environments that we work in, but supervision is not viewed as the primary problem. So when you're trying to sell relative advantage, it's, it can be complex if you're not targeting the thing that's their number one priority. Um, compatibility in terms of how an organization views what technology would bring to their organization or their ecosystem or their constituents that they're caring for is usually an easy sell. So a lot of people recognize we should be doing something with mobile phones. Computers obviously add value from a data collection, data management process. So that tends not to be a challenge to convince organizations that they should be using technology. However, it's a huge challenge to convince them that it's not too complex. Because often these systems really are truly complex. They require new training, they require new staff, and they require new ways of thinking. And so when we talk about the complexity, it's very easy to get stuck at this stage because these NGOs, you have to remember, these are billion dollar enterprises the larger ones, that are trying to deploy your technology. So when you are presenting the idea that you have, you're selling it to an organization that has as much bureaucracy as an academic university or any other major corporation. And that makes it a very complex problem no matter what you're trying to sell into that ecosystem. Trialability, again, this is fairly easy to sell from a technology standpoint, just do a pilot with 10 or 20 people. So you usually don't get stuck here when we're talking about technology adoption of IT. And then observability has been a huge problem in the IT industry. We don't have a lot of randomized control trials. We don't have a significant evidence base demonstrating the value of a lot of the pilots that have been going on. The reason for that is it's very expensive. Doing an RCT on a pilot costs more than the pilot itself. And so the 
ability to collect this evidence base that we need has been a big challenge in the industry. And I would add one more in the technology arena that we need to consider for how people perceive innovations, and that's the longevity of the intervention. With technology changing as fast as it is, and with so many new uh, ideas like SANA coming up or whatever another organization may be working on, a lot of NGOs are nervous, what's the next thing coming down the pipe? So they don't want to commit to what's out today because they're scared that in 12 months it's going to be obsolete. And so there's this growing issue in technology that the longevity of any particular technology is at risk, and that creates a pretty challenging environment to, uh, to try to scale in. Um, and this is the, the standard curve that uh, has been used in the business schools for the last 15 years since it came out. And it divides people into five different categories. And again, this was in the paper as well. We have the innovators, the early adopters, the early majority, the late majority, and the laggards. And when they uh, talk about who's going to use your technology first, it's in the innovators category. You're going to talk to somebody at an organization who's very forward thinking, who gets technology, who's willing to deploy it and go through the pains of piloting a new software. That's usually pretty easy. There are people out there who are itching to try technology in their organizations. The huge problem everybody's facing is what's called crossing the chasm. And this is, again, another term that's been popular for the last 10 or 20 years. And that's where you actually get past the innovator stage. So you're past the people who are already looking for technology, we're already excited to do a pilot, to people who are more pragmatic and they're a little bit more cautious. And you're providing them with an evidence base that brings them to an endpoint that they can see the value of your your product, your solution, or your process change. And that evidence base, in technology at least in IT, has been incredibly challenging to create. Again, for the same reason that it's very expensive to create that evidence base. Uh, and then the, the third area that, that is highlighted in the papers is really the contextual factors of the who's making the decision for innovation. And they break it down into three. We haven't really, in our experience at least, seen many different types of these systems. It's usually one person who's making the decision. It's one person in the NGO, it's the person who owns the budget, or it's one person in the ministry, the person who owns the budget. So for us, we haven't seen a lot of collective innovation decisions. We haven't seen a lot of uh, optional innovations decisions. It's usually authoritative innovation decisions. It's one person making the decision, I want to try out this technology, I want to try out this pilot. And so that's really the focus from a software point, at least what we see in the, the industry. So what are the challenges to high value innovation and adoption? The ecosystem in ICT for low resource settings, healthcare in particular, is very similar to traditional startups. Uh, we have the issues of what's your management team, how are you going to get this on the ground, who's your market, who's your customer, who are your competitors, and then again, the evidence base. This is critical. So when you're in a startup environment, the difference between having zero customers and one customer who's willing to say it worked is infinitely uh, impactful to your sales process. And similarly, the difference between having one pilot under your belt that you can reference versus zero pilots is infinitely useful when you're trying to sell to NGOs, trying to sell other people to pick up your technology and use it in low resource settings. Uh, but the fact that you can reference a pilot only goes so far. Eventually, they want to see actual outcomes. And again, this is incredibly challenging for uh, small organizations. My organization is one of the bigger technology firms out there in global health, and we have very few RCTs to prove reduced deaths in neonatal uh, mortality or improved outcomes, and this includes national systems that we've built. So it's just incredibly expensive, and a lot of technology companies don't focus on this because they don't want to invest their resources in that area. So um, as we look at that, that's where we're really struggling right now and where I think a lot of other organizations are struggling in terms of trying to spread their adoptions, and, sorry, spread their innovations and get it adopted across multiple organizations. Um, in terms of development, too, we want to know what the barriers to entry are. And if you're an open source firm, you don't want any barriers to entry, but you still have to realize, even if you're open source, you kind of want to do the work yourself. And so you're still in the back of your head, you have to decide how are you going to position yourself in the marketplace to spread your technology, to spread whatever it is you're trying to get out there. Um, and what's your plan overall? A lot of organizations start and they have a technology and they just want to do a pilot. And then they say they'll figure it out from there, which is akin to a lot of web startups who just try to get users. You know, we just want to see users and we'll figure out how to monetize them. Well, just doing a pilot doesn't go very far because the pilot has a finite timeline. And this is unique to the development industry versus uh, maybe developed countries' industries where you're trying to go sell to Ford, per se. When you do a pilot at Ford and it works, they just scale it up. When you do a pilot at an NGO and it works, they stop it. So if you have a six-month budget in an NGO to do a technology project on the ground, it's ending in six months unless more funding comes in the door, regardless of how well it works. 
And that's a fairly unique problem to what we're facing in low resource settings that are donor driven versus selling to an organization that's realizing the value itself. And the other thing to take away is the development sector, while it's a low resource setting and, and it's donor funded, is just as competitive as any other private sector. Um, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, there's many players, and there's a ton of grantsmanship, gamesmanship, positioning and marketing. So even though you're, you're thinking about low resource settings or you're looking at low resource settings, it's got all of the same characteristics as any other private market when it comes to getting money from the donor community. It's a totally different ballgame if you're targeting end consumers, but when we're talking about trying to get donor money, which is still what funds a lot of this stuff, it's its own industry. And often innovation here is the easy part. Coming up with the idea, and this is true of startups in general, coming up with the idea is not the hard part. The hard part is how are you going to get it deployed on the ground, how are you going to iterate with it, and how are you going to get local organizations to adopt it. Um, and utilizing innovation often means implementing change management, and this is truly the hard part. So when you come up with an innovative idea, it's easy to see the value of it. It's easy for people to say, that looks like a good idea, I want to use that. It's really hard to see how that would be used in an organization. Um, and that's because roles and responsibilities will change throughout the organization. Uh, cultural norms and communication will need to adopt. Um, attitude of continuous improvement needs to be adop uh, adopted. And I think that's a critical piece for us. So when we go into a lot of organizations and try to convince them using technology is going to be beneficial for them, using technology is going to make their the work easier, that's only true if they're really committed to doing continuous improvement and performance improvement and quality improvement. If we just put the technology in there and use it out of the box and we're not innovating with them, it's not actually going to be that useful. And that's also a hard sell. So we're selling them not only should you use our technology, should you try this in your environment, but you should also have somebody actually caring about the data coming in and actually caring about the system that you're trying to deploy. And if they don't already have that mentality, you can't just create that role very easily inside the organization. Uh, you're going to get pushback from people who are scared or don't understand a particular innovation, particularly if it changes job roles or responsibilities. And that's not unique to low resource settings. It's not unique to technology. That's just a general problem when you're trying to introduce a disruptive technology that actually changes or eliminates job function. Um, and ultimately, it's, it's critical to understand when you're introducing innovation, people don't know how to get to where you're trying to lead them or they'd already be there. And so when you're trying to convince people you should be using mobile phones to collect data or you should be using computers to, to better monitor your medical records, they probably already believe that. And the problem is they don't know how to get from point A to point B. So convincing them they should use technology is not the problem. Convincing them how they're going to do it is a huge problem. And often organizations who are good at creating technology are not good at understanding the realities of large organizations, knowing how bureaucracies work, and knowing how to uh, communicate across multiple constituents. So this can be a big problem because the innovators will go and say, well, just use our technology. And the organizations will say, well, that's a great idea, but I can't see how I get from point A to point B. And that point A to point B gap is a very big problem when you, we go back to the innovation perception, the complexity. And so we need to figure out a way to make it more clear. And the way you make it more clear is by referencing your pilot customers. But as we talked about, the pilot customers don't go to scale with you. So we're caught in this trap of not being able to paint a picture of people getting from point A to point B. And part of that can be solved by what I consider agile deployment. And I don't know, how many people in the room are familiar with software engineering or have dealt with software before? So several. Um, there's been a big in, uh, movement in the last 10, 20, 30 years in the uh, software space to move to what's called agile development. And this allows you to adapt your requirements quicker um, than we used to be able to because back in the 60s and 70s, we used to do a lot of waterfall development, which means we did a year of requirements gathering and then three years of implementing software and then we would deploy it. And people said, well, that's crazy because the requirements change too much. Um, so we came up with this agile software development methodology where you reevaluate the requirements basically on a constant basis. What we haven't done is figured out how to solve that problem for deploying technology. So once the software is written, it's bug free and we want to deploy it, we're still doing waterfall deployment. And that means that, uh, you know, for example, the national record in Zambia, we designed that system in 04. So we were using Microsoft technology, we were using databases on the computers, and we had no vision whatsoever of using mobile technology. In just five years, our technology became relatively obsolete. And that was just five years. And a lot of uh, planning went into our five-year plan 
And we had no, no idea that what was going to happen with uh, iPhones and Android was, had any chance of occurring. So as you think about deploying these technologies and spreading your innovation, we don't have a lot of good models to reference to say, well, how do we become more agile at deploying technology? How do we future-proof what we're working on? And I think this is a growing problem that the rapid pace of technology is creating. And we don't have good solutions for it. We haven't seen good models of how do I, as a National Minister of Health, uh, deal with this? How do, how do I allow for technology adoption, innovation adoption, while still not getting left behind if I pick a technology today that I know will be obsolete in five years? Uh, we have no idea how quickly tablet prices are going to come down or whether netbooks are going to be uh, around in five years. So there's a lot of uncertainty that people have in making these technology decisions and, and what they decide when they're going to adopt innovation. Uh, and when we think about what we should do as innovators and as people in organizations trying to get our innovations out there, we have to plan for new competitors and new partners. And we have to plan for them to enter while we had a scale-up plan in place already because this happens in every project we've worked in. So 10 times out of 10, we'll be working in a country, we have a project plan, and we realize somebody is doing 50% of the same project with another NGO. And we have to figure out, do we want to collaborate, or do we want to compete with them, or how are we going to play in that ecosystem? And you can choose any number of strategies to make your project successful, but you, you have to plan for that occurring, uh, because it will. And so be cognizant that if you are deploying a project, or if you're working on spreading an innovation in one of these low resource settings, you are absolutely going to have somebody else in that country trying to do a similar thing, and you have to decide how are you going to partner or compete with that other organization on the ground. Um, so specific difficulties in low-resource settings, particularly when it comes to technology. A lot of the large NGOs are heavily driven by the large donors. This could be the U.S. government, it could be the European government, or people like the Gates Foundation. Um, often we see three- to five-year plans that are funded, and many of the deliverables are determined up front, and that's the critical problem. So if we have a three to five year plan where I have to set in motion, I'm going to roll out this national EMR for five years, I do not want to get to year two, go back to the donor and say, actually, we should rewrite this. Windows is the wrong technology. We should have done this on mobile phones. Mobile phones will be much more pervasive than they are now. Let's just plan for the future. They want you to do what you were going to do, and they want you to spend what you said you were going to spend to do it. And there's very little interest that the people who cut the checks have in you changing plans on them. And this is the critical takeaway when you're talking about trying to introduce new innovation into these environments. If you're trying to sell to an organization that's heavily donor funded, once their contract or grant is locked down, they do not want to change anything in that. They want to execute that grant, and they want to do it under the budget they said they were going to. Now, that doesn't mean you cannot work with them, and it doesn't mean they aren't great partners, because a lot of the three to five year plans have unknown entries of how they're going to solve particular problems. We're highly successful in working with these large NGOs to introduce technology when they said it was going to be determined. But if they already put in what technology they were going to use, it's very challenging to change their mind. It's very challenging to get them to switch midstream to another uh, technology. So as we're selling into these environments, we have to realize the ecosystem that we're working with if we're in the donor-funded donor environment. And what that ecosystem causes, that these are locked down three to five years ahead of time, is a lot of duplication of innovation. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. A lot of people, a lot of people think we need to see you know, a thousand flowers bloom and then pick the best winners. But in the software space, in the technology space for low resource settings, people are getting fed up that we've been letting a thousand flowers bloom for too long. They want to see people actually scale these projects. So we're in this interesting space right now in the technology adoption uh, world where people are saying, you guys have been talking about the benefits of EMRs and mobile health for a while now. Let's see it and let's see you guys scale. Uh, and so there are, you know, technology being built into these three to five year plans at this point. So there is some uh, significant investment going on that, that should be able to prove this. But even once that's proven, we're still, we're still going to face this problem. Um, the other downside of this is there's a lack of collaboration. Once you have your three to five year plan and you find out somebody is doing something similar and you still want to collect your money, you don't necessarily have an interest in going back to the donor and saying, hey, look, we have overlapping activities. Let's figure out how to harmonize these together. Uh, because that will mean less money for the NGO if they go back and say that. So there's not a huge interest in collaborating. Plus, collaboration does slow people down. Um, even with the best intentions, collaboration is harder. It means more moving parts and more people. And so from that standpoint, it can be very challenging to convince people they want to uh, collaborate. Um, that also means that there's a lack of adjustment to realities on the ground. If we have somebody who's managing a contract in the DC office and has no idea what's going on in Ghana, it's not likely we can convince that person in DC that the project plan in Ghana is not going to work. 
And that creates a big challenge if you're trying to sell to the US-based office, which is typically how these sales get done, and then it's implemented in a country where they don't necessarily have the visibility they need. So you might have people on the ground, you might be working with people on the ground to adopt your innovation, and then you find out that it's not gonna work the way you said it. You have the same disincentive that they do to go back to them and say, well, actually, we got this wrong. Let's figure out plan A, because you, you sold them that you knew the problem and you knew the solution. So if you go in there and you say, well, actually, it was a different problem or we need a different solution, that can be awkward and you don't necessarily want to have that discussion with the people you're working with. So there's all these disincentives to really, uh, to, to correctly localize these innovations and, and get them ad adapted. But that's not necessarily unique to the donor sector, right? If you go in and sell to a large organization and then you get in there and you say, uh, Ford, I didn't realize your brake pads were like this, our solution's not gonna work, they don't wanna hear that either. So the idea that they don't wanna hear you say what you sold them is not gonna work is definitely not unique to the donor sector, it's not unique to low resource settings. But the fact that we have these three to five year plans which are largely locked down ahead of time is relatively unique. Now, every organization has budgeting cycles, every organization has uh, different ways that they can adopt innovation. So again, there's, there's similarities to standard business practices here. Uh, but specifically in the donor sector, this is a unique problem. And what this leads to, which is where I think we're stuck right now in technology, is what I consider pilot churn. So these three to five year plans that leave some open-ended technology questions make it very easy to do pilots. We have great success going and saying, let's do a six month pilot on SMS for logistics, or let's do a six month pilot on using phones to improve community health. Um, what we don't have a lot of success doing to date, and what I think a lot of people don't have success doing to date, is selling national visions and getting those funded or selling uh, you know, large-scale adoption across multiple countries. There are technologies that we've built that are getting there, and there are technologies that other people have built, like Partners in Health with their medical record system, that are reaching that point, but it's taken a lot longer than I think people anticipated in terms of getting large-scale pilots to scale. And the reason for that is those three to five year plans mean that your pilot partner is not your scale-up partner. And that's the critical difference when you're selling into global health, is that you can sell a Sigma pilot, and again, no matter how successful that pilot is, it will stop. If you have a budget that's being paid by somebody else, that organization will not continue that pilot, no matter how successful it was, unless they have another check from somebody else to run it. And that's a critical problem that's, that is very unique to global health or very unique to donor-funded cycles. When you're selling inside an organization who realizes all the value themselves, it's easy to see what's going to happen. But in the donor industry, who realizes the value of these solutions. It's the government who's not paying the check, right? We are trying to convince the Ministry of Health in Zambia of the benefit of using a medical record system that the CDC is paying for. So when we try to convince the government and they say that's a great idea, the CDC is the one we have to go convince to cut the check even though the ministry thinks it's a good idea or high value. So we have this complex cycle where the people cutting the check are not the ones realizing the value of the innovation. And this, this again is unique to donor funded environments and this creates an incredibly complex sales process because you can have a highly successful, highly innovative, highly impactful pilot that nobody's interested in scaling from a financial standpoint that everybody agrees is a great idea. So we have tons of great ideas in technology, whether it's software or new drugs or new medical devices that, that are massively impactful, but nobody's interested in funding them. And a great example of this, if you guys are interested in HIV and healthcare, is looking at male circumcision. So I encourage all of you to go home and read about male circumcision. When the initial studies came out that demonstrated uh, very high correlations between areas in Africa that had uncircumcised males and areas that had circumcised male and the uh, spread of HIV in those circumstances, it's as effective, according to some people, as the vaccines we're trying to make in terms of reducing the spread of HIV across patients. That was found in about 2000, and we still haven't made massive male circumcision campaigns. And again, this is literally the same rate of reducing transmission that vaccines are trying to do. So you can see that some of these innovations in process or technology or even just in uh, behavior can be demonstrated to be massively impactful and yet not adopted. And that's because you're convincing one group that has the money and another group that realizes the value to think the same and cut the checks in the right way that affect your project. And that makes innovation and adoption in low resource settings a pretty unique problem from that standpoint. And it's a huge issue for software, uh, given everything else we talked about in terms of future proofing, in terms of the adoption curve of, uh, and the transition of devices. It creates this really uh, difficult area that we stay in. So people are very successful getting pilots, um, but 
we're, we're finding a lot of challenges in getting these to scale. And again, this is not unique to the pilot sector. A lot of startups have an easy time going in, doing a beta pilot, and saying this is a good idea. And then the organization, even though it worked, doesn't want to cut the check due to the fact that they have too many complex organizational changes going on internally, or they have a lot of, uh, a lot of other pilots they're trying to do, and they just don't want to scale it. So it's not uncommon in any startup to have a good finding, a good result, and for some reason not be able to scale it with that particular organization. But it happens a lot more in the development sector than in normal industries. Um, so what are the factors for success, though? How do you create successful pilots and how do you scale them? Um, I think the thing that we've learned over time, and this is not unique to software, but uh, is to ground truth and iterate quickly. You gotta get in there and you gotta figure out why you're wrong, because you are. Everything we've ever designed in Boston, when we've taken it to the field, something was wrong with it, and sometimes very significant things were wrong. And so the faster you can get on the ground, the faster you can work with your end users, the better equipped you're gonna be to scale your innovation. And most successful projects we've seen created what we consider a rapid response team. This is a team that's able to respond very quickly to new ideas from the field, to respond to, uh, to bugs or issues that come in from the field, whether it's software or device. Um, this, this is something that we need to uh, utilize because it allows us to get better buy-in from the local constituents that we're working with and create a better product at the end of the day. Uh, you need to position yourself for the long-term horizon even if you're doing a pilot. And that's because you need to be selling inside the organization saying where are we going to go find money for the next pilot, where are we going to go find money to scale. You cannot wait till you get the pilot result because you will lose all the momentum that you created during the pilot. And this is something critical that organizations fail to realize is the second you start your pilot, you've got to be selling the next phase. You have to be in there thinking about what's next, assuming you're going to have a successful pilot. If your pilot's unsuccessful, you don't have to worry about any of this because it's not going anywhere. But presuming that you have a successful pilot, you need to be uh, working before the pilot ends to figure out how am I going to carry forward my research, how am I going to carry forward the activities I'm working on. Also, engage multiple partners. This is obvious and it's just like selling to multiple clients, but you, even if you're working in a particular country, you need to find more partners because the characteristics that make your pilot successful can be unique to a particular organization. So you need to convince yourself, A, that your product is actually working because of the fact that your product's good, not because that particular organization was good at using it. And you need to hedge that you're going to get a good result across multiple organizations. Uh, one thing that we talk a lot about is not automating broken processes. And this is a, a thing we throw out in the software world. Software is not going to help an organization who's dysfunctional to function better. Software will help an organization who's functioning OK function really well. And that's similar to other projects and uh, products, not just software. Syringes will help better deliver drugs that are being delivered to begin with. They will not fix the problem that the drug wasn't at the clinic in the first place. So you need to make sure that the fundamental baseline process you need to create your innovative solution is there. And the more dependencies you have on that process, the more important it is to engage multiple partners because you are very uh, beholden to the process in place by the partner. And if you have a process sensitive innovation, you need to go see as many different processes as you can to figure out which ones won't work and what your baseline requirements are. We do a lot of work in community health. And when we get into our projects, we often find there's nobody actually doing the household visits. They're making up the data on paper. And so our baseline requirement actually turned out not to be that the program's function at all. It turned out to be that somebody's job is to supervise that program. Because if there's somebody accountable for that, we can get them the data that says, look, they're not performing well, do a quality improvement initiative. But if nobody cares about the fact that they're not doing the visits, we have nobody to inform. We have nobody to convince you need to be a better supervisor. And so our requirement was, and we thought our requirement was, make sure they're starting to do their household visits, but it's not. It's make sure there's a supervisor who cares about the program. And so that was very interesting to us as we didn't think that was our requirement to begin with. Um, and this is just something I like to throw out because it's definitely true of myself and, and all the teams I work in. Entrepreneurs are good at predicting odds. They're terrible at predicting timelines. So if you're trying to sell to a client, you think, I have a 75% you know, chance that I'm going to close this deal. Entrepreneurs are relatively ac accurate on that. But in terms of the optimism that we have for how quickly a project will start and how quickly a project will execute, we are terrible. These things take so much longer than we ever anticipated. And there's a lot of hurry up and wait. And this is hurry up and wait is not unique to donors. But large organizations in general, if they have a fire, they call you. They say, we need this tomorrow. And then as soon as it's not a fire, they don't care. They won't talk to you for two months. So when we talk about doing pilots, you're particularly uh, exposed to that problem because you don't have set relationships, you don't have a set project timeline. And so an entrepreneur trying to 
land clients and pilots in this ecosystem, uh, you have a lot of risk in timeline. And so from a funding standpoint and just a livelihood standpoint for you and your co-founders or you and the people you work with, this is a huge danger. So when, when we talk about getting to scale, we have to be cognizant that it could take a lot longer than we think and we have to protect how are we gonna make a living during that time when my pilot got delayed by six months or 12 months. And again, that's not unique to global health, that's just a unique problem to startups in general or young ideas in general. And I think it's completely necessary to create this culture of continuous improvement. If you are trying to deploy technology, you're trying to deploy software into an organization, you must be working with people who are interested, not in deploying this once and having that be the end. It, you need organizations that are interested in innovating with you. If you're trying to work with an organization who just wants to cut the check, you are not going to be successful in deploying your technology because they're not gonna be invested in making sure it works with you, they're not gonna be invested in improving it with you. And so run away from those organizations that are not interested in being innovators with you and that are interested in, in really getting into continuous improvement because it will not make your, your product successful. Until you've already crossed that chasm and you're just selling a completely finished product, then you're okay. But if you're on the other side of that and you're still trying to sell to innovators and you're still trying to figure out the exact solution you wanna use, you need to be conscious of what type of organizations you're working with. And uh, finally, you wanna create pull. The or, again, the organization might have $50,000 lying around to do a pilot. When they write that check to you, they're not really saying, I believe in your idea. They're saying you were the first person to come talk to me that I thought would be easy to do a $50,000 pilot with. So you have to make sure that you're creating pull within that organization and you're, you're actually creating something they want. Or you have to realize that this pilot's gonna end, there's no next step with this organization. Do I really wanna do that work? And the answer can be yes. There's plenty of valuable things to learn. That organization will now be more exposed to technology and more willing to use it. So it's not all downside to do a pilot that has a finite endpoint, but at some point you do need to ask yourself, is it worth doing this pilot again when I don't think it's gonna go anywhere and invest in really finding partners who wanna take things to scale with you? Uh, one of the things we talk a lot about inside of Demagi is focusing on the ground game. So get people on, in the field using it, no matter how small a user base you have, and you will learn infinitely more than creating sales material, working on PowerPoints, doing talks in the US. So you wanna get people on the ground using your technology, whether it's software or something else, as soon as you can to really understand, is this working, is this a viable product, and do people actually value it? And sometimes, do people actually value it doesn't happen right away. It happens after you figure out, well, I'm not selling it the right way, I'm not framing this the right way, I'm not selling to the right constituents. So you can have a completely viable innovation that should be scaled, that is useful, and you won't realize you're not positioning it correctly until you get on the ground and say, well, the community health workers don't value this at all, but their supervisors really value it. So I need to not sell it as a community health improvement tool, I need to sell it as a supervisory tool. Um, and so finally, I'll, I'll conclude with some uh, lessons that we've learned, uh, and these are fairly generic, but they, they apply very specifically to software. Um, fail quickly, and I can't emphasize the need for this more, and be honest about your failures. The, uh, the ability to, to deploy innovation into low resource settings, nobody thinks you're gonna get it right the first time. And if you tell them you are, they're not gonna believe you because we've seen lots of technology and lots of software go into the field and need to be adapted. So don't be afraid to fail and don't be afraid to admit failure, but do continuously look for how am I gonna make this better? How am I going to improve what's not working? It's okay to fail as long as you have the next step. It's not okay to hide your failure and then come up and say, well, oops, it didn't work. And so get out there and fail quickly and don't be afraid to fail. You know, really uh, try to take some chances and, and iterate out there. And make sure you're really solving a felt need with high value. And what I mean by high value is something that has a valuable ROI in investing in that technology. We can solve data collection with iPad tablets really well, but it's not worth a $600 device in every person's hand to make that work. And Demagi's been as guilty of this as anybody, often we spend too much money to solve a problem that could have worked on paper, or it could have worked for a much cheaper solution, but because the budget was there, we're like, well, why, why not do it this fancier way? And so we really need to be cognizant of, uh, is this a high value solution to the problem? Because a lot of things can be used to solve different characteristics of the ecosystem and global health and low resource settings. Uh, we can use solar, we can use wind power, we can do a lot of things, but do you really need power to begin with? Does this require something fancier? Can I do this with much lower tech? And so that's not to say don't spend money, that's not to say don't create innovative technology, but it is saying make sure the particular thing you're trying to solve is A, a felt need, and B, the particular thing you're doing is highly valuable to that felt need. Um, we've gotten in situations before where 
we thought we were solving a really important problem. And uh, there was a research project that came out of the University of Michigan several years back where they did this big uh, intervention with vitamin A deficiency. So uh, a lot of women in low resource settings have vitamin A deficiencies and giving them vitamin A during their pregnancy significantly increases outcomes. They did this in the community and got, um, I think, 15 to 30% improvement in outcomes. Uh, but the community didn't actually value lowering neonatal deaths. To them, childbirth was a process that had a loss rate, and they were used to seeing that loss rate. So they didn't have a felt need of, do we want to decrease neonatal deaths? Now, that doesn't mean you can't do uh, behavioral interventions or other interventions to make that a felt need, but that's likely not uh, easy for a company who's a technology innovator to know how to do behavior change. So if the felt need isn't there to begin with, you have a whole sales process ahead of you before you can even convince people to use your technology. And in environments that we're working in some of my other companies where we're trying to sell into the US, if we go into a meeting and we have to convince them of why it's worth using uh, voice analytics to process telephone conversations, we are not going to make that sell because we have to spend the entire meeting convincing them of this other thing before we can convince them that our technology works. We want to spend all the time over here convincing them our technology is the right solution to your problem, not convincing them that they have a problem. And so be very cognizant when you're in an environment where you have to convince people of what the problem is, because that doubles your, your problem. You have to first figure out that how to frame this is really a problem and you should really value it as a, a, high, a big problem, then let me convince you out of the solution. You want to go after the things that have felt problems, felt needs. Um, and know whether you're going to collaborate or compete or do both. A lot of organizations in the space, I think, are dishonest with themselves in terms of what type of organization they want to be. It's completely fine to be a very self-sufficient organization, not want to work with a lot of partners in the space. Apple is incredibly successful with this as, as a business model. Um, so it's not, it's not uh, a problem to do this. But be open about what type of company you want to be. If you think you're the only people who can deploy your process or technology because you know it better than everybody else, and it is that complex and you don't want to share it, that's fine. But make that clear and make it clear why that's true. And if you want to be collaborative, that's great too. Uh, a lot of groups that we work with are collaborative. Demagi is a very open and collaborative environment. But we're very honest about the things that we want to own and that we think Demagi can do better than everybody else. And that honesty helps the adoption of our technology. It helps people value what Demagi does um, in, a, in an honest and open way. And we're not, you know, we don't say we wish people would just take our technology and deploy it and not talk to us. We do want to see all of our open source technology adopted, but we do think we have high value to add. We've done a lot of projects in a lot of places, and so we're honest with what our skill sets are versus what we want other organizations to do. And if you cloud that line with your innovation, it makes it very hard for organizations who are considering adopting it to know where you stop and where they begin. And that's a big problem in that complexity perception that we were talking about as well. What do you really do for me? Do you manage the project? Do you go do the implementation on the ground? When do I take this over? Uh, you want to be clear about that, and you want to have those parameters set. And finally, uh, everything you do is sales. So even if you're not a salesman, if you're the technologist, every meeting you're in, every ministry you're talking to, every requirements project you're doing, this is all selling for scale. What is the next step? And you don't have to focus on selling in the traditional sense of cold calling people and having all your glossy marketing material. But you have to be selling the vision of how your thing's going to scale. How are you going to get your innovation adopted? And if you don't think you're doing that when you're in meetings, you're kidding yourself. Because every single meeting you're having is about how is this project going to be successful and then what am I going to do with it next? So you always need to be considering uh, what, what am I selling, who am I selling to, and how do I want to sell? And again, you can have the most unsalesy sales process. Uh, Demagi has no dedicated sales staff. But we still recognize every time I send out one of our programmers to the field to work with the ministry, that's a reflection on Demagi, that's a reflection on our capability to scale. And so you have to be cognizant that every interaction you have, whether it's your field staff, you or somebody else, is uh, going to create a perception of how complex, how adaptable, how high value your innovation is. And that's all going to affect your chance to scale, whether that's a software product or something else. Um, so with that, I believe I'm all set on the talk. And I'd like to open it up for Q&A around any of the stuff we discussed, uh, whether it's innovation in software or else. Yep.